The following program is paid for by the friends and partners of Joyce Meyer Ministries. I believe if we're confident that it releases us from jealousy and envy and we don't have to live in that torment. I believe it releases us from the need to compare and compete and try to be like everybody else. I believe knowing who you are in Christ releases you to be the precious, awesome, wonderful person that God has created you to be. God's got an individual plan for each one of our lives, and if he chose for Peter to suffer and be crucified upside down, and if he chose for John to live maybe another 20 or 25 years after Peter did, he's saying, Peter, that's none of your business. My plan for you is right for you, and my plan for him is right for him. And we have to stop being jealous of what everybody else has got or the way God's doing things with them and learn that God's got a plan for us. Amen? The Bible says that jealousy and envy rots the bones. Proverbs 14, 30. I'll tell you what, if you're eat, you, 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 hear the, you hear the phrase, just eaten up with envy. And it's a worldly phrase, but it's so true. When you get jealous of somebody else and you can't be happy for them when they're blessed, it just eats you up inside. And you know, there's sometimes when I see somebody else, maybe even somebody in, in ministry having a greater success in an area than I am, I'm not gonna say that I don't feel that sometimes, but I fight it. I am not gonna have that poison in my life. And you know how I fight it? God, I thank you for blessing them. I'm glad you're blessing them. I mean, I feel glad right then, but the devil's not going to know it. I thank you for blessing them. I thank you for helping them. And God, I know. You got to talk out loud. Talk back to the devil. You got to say, I thank you, God, that you've got a plan for me. And my day's coming. I may not get exactly what they've got, but you've got something for me. And when it comes, it's going to be just as good as anything that anybody else has got. Stop sitting passively by and letting the devil rule. Come on, you know how to talk. You just need to talk right. <laughs> James 4 was a life-changing scripture for me. I'd like to share it with you, the first three verses. What leads to strife and discord and feuds? and How do conflicts and quarrels and fights get started among you? I love that. What, what's all the upset over, he's saying? Everybody's got a bone to pick. Everybody's mad about something. Strife and feuds and quarrels and arguments and anger and bitterness. Where does it come from? Do they not arise from your sensual desires that are ever warring in your bodily members? Now watch. You are jealous and you covet what others have. Do you know how upsetting it is? How it keeps us frustrated and stirred up? If we're going to look at what God's doing with everybody else in the world and compare that to what he's doing with us. Come on, tonight I want somebody in the house to realize God has got a unique, one-of-a-kind, awesome, amazing plan for you. And don't you have some old sour, negative attitude and say, well, yeah, if he's got such a great plan, then why am I not seeing it? Well, probably because of just what I'm trying to preach to you tonight. <laughs> Maybe you've got to get a new attitude first. Maybe you've got to learn how to be happy for what God's doing in somebody else's life before you can release him to do something in your life. It's not accidental that you get to hear all these testimonies of people and all their success. Oh, God sets us up. Okay, here's a testimony for you. They've got what you've been praying for for 20 years. How are you going to take that? Oh, well, God wouldn't do that. Yeah, he would. So many things in life are a test. And after we have passed the test, our reward will come. Don't ever let yourself be jealous of what somebody else has. This goes on to say, you know, you just, all this fighting and 
fussing and feuding is just because of the stuff you want and you don't know how to get it. So you see somebody that's got what you want and you get jealous and envious and then you can even begin to hate them and that's like murder as far as your hearts are concerned. Beautiful, beautiful few words that was life changing for me. This is what the Bible says. You have not because you ask not. And you know what I learned from that? Don't ever be jealous of anybody else. Just ask God for what you want and then trust Him to give it to you the right way at the right time. Amen. And trust Him not to give it to you if what you're asking for is not God's best for you. Amen. Now there's certain things in the Bible that we know that God wants all of us to have. They're right there plain and black and white. They're one of His promises. But there are many other things that the Bible doesn't tell you. You might be praying to be the worship leader in your church. Well, that's going to have to be one of those if it's your will type things. And if you think this jealousy is only in the world and not in the church, you are very wrong. We bring all of our baggage right into the pew with us and sit there with it week after week. Well, I wish I could sing like you. And, well, actually, I think I sing better than you, and I think that I'm the one that should be up there and not you. I can remember when I was teaching my little 20-person home Bible study, and I'd been doing it five years, and I had such a big vision, and I was so sick and tired of little. <laughs> Don't despise the day of small beginnings. I just I wanted something big. <laughs> big. Because I was very insecure back then and didn't know who I was in Christ, and I was still trying to work out all the shame and blame from my past and the guilt and the condemnation I had. And I, I needed something big out here to make me feel good about myself. And God wasn't going to give it to me until things in here were fixed. Come on now, I'm preaching good. Because if God gives us a bunch of out here stuff and we've got nothing in here, then the first little storm that comes along, it blows us away. See, I like what I'm doing. I enjoy it, but I don't know. Maybe I won't be able to do this all my life. That's not going to really make me any less valuable. Because our value is in who we are in Christ, not in what we do. And I tell you, if we don't learn this, we're going to be in big trouble. Because I don't care how well you do what you do. The time will come when somebody will come along that will be able to do it better. No matter how fast a runner runs, somebody breaks his record. No matter how fast a swimmer swims, somebody breaks his record. No matter how many music CDs a singer sells, no matter how many gold records he gets, somebody comes along and breaks his record. We have to learn how to go with the seasons of God in our life and realize that we're just as valuable in every season. I believe if we're confident that it releases us from jealousy and envy and we don't have to live in that torment. I believe it releases us from the need to compare and compete and try to be like everybody else. I believe knowing who you are in Christ releases you to be the precious, awesome, wonderful person that God has created you to be. And you can be that without any apology. I am different. I'm different and I like it. I like it. I used to think I was weird. Now I know I'm unique. <laughs> unique has value. Darlene Check, you know, the wonderful worship leader from Hillsong said to me last year, she said, don't you just love to cook when you're off and at home? And I said, no. Why would I want to do that? <laughs> well, you know, she, she just loves all that. And so sometimes we just can't figure out why people don't love what we love. And then sometimes if I didn't know who I was in Christ, then I could feel pressured. Because Susie Homemaker, I'm not. <laughs> I'll wrestle with a demon for you, but don't ask me to make your roast. Because that won't work. Amen? I remember when I tried to sing and I tried to learn to play a guitar because I knew another preacher that could not only preach but sing and play a guitar. And so if he could do it, I wanted to do it. Well, the problem is, is I almost failed music. 
I can't play a guitar. I could play a harmonica just a little bit, but not too good. You know, I remember reading Ephesians 4.11 back in the early days of my walk with God, and I would go to services, and there was a lot of talk about the gifts, and, you know, and everybody was like, well, what's your gift? What's your gift? <laughs> Anybody remember being around in those days where that was just like the, I mean, there were even whole meetings on trying to figure out what your spiritual gift was, and, you know, I, I mean, I'm sure that has value, but you know what? I still haven't figured out what I am. I mean, I go places and they say, well, what would you like us to call you, Reverend, Bishop, Apostle? I just like, call me Joyce, you know? <laughs> That's what I am. But I remember being so insecure when I would look at the five-fold ministry gifts listed in Ephesians, Apostle, Prophet, Evangelist, Pastor, Teacher, and I remember having somebody teach it like that. Apostle, Prophet, Evangelist, Pastor, Teacher. And I thought, well, wait a minute, I don't want to be a little finger. I'm just telling you the truth. I wanted to be the thumb. I didn't want, you know. <laughs> and I thought because he was saying that the teacher was the little finger, it had to be the littlest gift. And it's amazing how ridiculous we are sometimes. Let's go to Romans 12 for just a minute. Come on, it's time for you to like yourself. Romans 12 talks about how there's many of us, but we're all parts of one body. We all have a different function, but we're still all parts of one body. And then he talks about how, you know, some are this and some are that and some are something else. And, but let's just talk about our physical body, which is the example that God uses. My physical body has a lot of different parts, but they're not all alike. They don't look alike. They don't have the same function. Different parts have certain privileges that other parts don't have. Different parts are more visible than other parts. And what a mess it would be if my physical body was all jealous of all the other parts. <laughs> you see, we need to work together. Every once in a while, I'll get a new pair of shoes that are a little hard to get on, and you know, you're wrestling with it. And you know, it's amazing to me because it, my hand just immediately comes to its rescue and helps there. And you know, I have a pretty ring up here, and my finger gets to wear it, but my eye gets to see it. My finger's never seen the ring. It gets to wear it, it gets to sport it around, but all of its whole life, it will never see the ring. The eye doesn't get to wear the ring, but it sees the ring. Now, what would happen if my hand said, I am not going to help you put that shoe on? Because the truth of the matter is, is I would like to have shoes myself. And in my whole life as the hand, I have never had shoes. And if you think that I'm going to keep helping you get your shoes on all my life, you are sadly mistaken. And what if the eye said, I refuse to look at the ring. I will not look at the ring. I want my own ring. And if I cannot have a ring, then I will refuse to wear the ring. And so this is kind of the way, as Christians, we go through life a lot. What if God gave us our will and said, Okay. <laughs> and you know what? I think half the time. <laughs> I mean, we better hope don't, that God don't give us some of the stuff we're asking for. That's the way we look as Christians sometimes. We're wearing our shoes on our hands and our jewelry on our eyes. And... But praise God, we got what we wanted. 
Only problem is, now I got my jewelry on my eyes. I can't see where I'm going, so I'm <laughs> bumping into stuff, hurting people. I believe confidence sets us free from all that. I don't have to have what you have. I can be happy without it. I don't have to do what you do. You don't even have to like me for me to be happy because my joy is not based on what you think of me. It's based on who I am in Christ. I can step out and try something and fail at it and still be happy and confident because my confidence is not in succeeding at everything I try to do. I can miss God. I can think I heard from God and just flat out miss God and that still doesn't diminish who I am in Christ. I don't have to play it safe. I can live boldly. I can live aggressively. And people who do that will end up doing great things for God. They may do a few silly things once in a while, but I'll tell you one thing, you can't drive a parked car. Some of you need to get it in gear and get moving. Even if you have a wreck or two, you need to be moving. Woo, I'm happy tonight. We need to get rid of some worldly mindsets. You need to retrain your mind. Get rid of that, well, yeah, I, I can't do that, I'm too old. <laughs> you know what, I, I, I've had to fight that just a tad. And I'll tell you when it started. I, I never thought I was old, I don't feel old, I don't think I look old, I don't think I act old, but you know, two years ago, I had to go sign up for Medicare. Oh. <laughs> that felt old. And then last year, I had to go in and sign up for Social Security. I mean, I'm telling you the honest truth. When I had to get the Medicare and the Social Security, the devil actually tried to use that to put like this, well, I'm too old. Not, you know, not really too old to do, but it was just like different things would come up and I, I was starting to get this, well, I'm getting old. And you know what? If you start thinking old, everything else in your life will follow suit. You'll start dressing old. You can go out, come on now, you can go out to a nice department store and you can see where the old line starts. <laughs> because I'm trying to share with you that you're never too old and you're never too young. When Caleb was 80 and they were passing out the land that was gonna to belong to them, Caleb asked for a mountain. He said, give me a mountain. Moses, I believe, was 80 years old when God called him to bring the Israelites through the desert and lead them to the, 80! A lady told me a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago, she said, when I was 75, God called me to go to Africa and build him an orphanage. <laughs> 75. But you see, the world will give you that thinking and it will steal your confidence. Pastor Tommy said every Monday night, he plays basketball for two hours straight without stopping with 20 year olds. You know why he can do that? Because he's never stopped doing it. Come on, that's why he can do it, because he's never stopped doing it. And some of you could be doing a lot of stuff, but you stopped doing it a long time ago because the world got you convinced that you were now too old. You're never too young, not if God anoints you. Timothy was young, I think 17. And Paul had to keep encouraging him. He would get afraid and insecure. Jeremiah was young. And for goodness sakes, don't ever say, well, I can't do that. I'm just a woman. <laughs> and that thinking has been embedded. 
Now, I mean, I've gotten over that, but let me tell you something. When God first called me to do this, first of all, when he first called me, I didn't have enough sense to know that people were going to get aggravated about it because I was a woman. I mean, I really just didn't. I mean, I just loved God, and I felt like he called me, and I just went at it and was being fairly successful. And then people started crabbing because I was a woman, and I went back to God and said, I'm a woman. <laughs> like he was going to say, oh, I didn't know that. I remember when a pastor that we had stopped Dave and I at the door one day when we were going out of church, and he looked at my husband and he said, Brother, you should be teaching that Bible study in your home, not your wife. Well, we tried. Dave tried to teach and I tried to shut up. Neither one worked. People always want to know, well, how does Dave feel about you being in the position you're in and him having a little more behind-the-scenes position? Dave Meyer is right where he wants to be. And he's happy about it because he is not trying to be something that he's not. We're not in competition. He has a role. I have a role. And even though it's not the normal role that the world would model, it's still God's role, and it's working. Amen. Woo. But you see, I don't have some rebellious attitude because I'm up here like, oh, well, I'm blessed to God, you know, you're going to listen to me, you know. I'm actually quite a submissive wife, believe it or not. And don't you laugh. You know, women are amazing. Amazing. We have babies. We are amazing. A woman gave birth to the Savior. Women were the last at the cross and the first at the tomb. The Bible says Mary got up early. And when Jesus appeared to her, she had to go back and get the boys out of bed. Now, guys, I love you, but it's a fact. Women were the last ones at the cross and the first ones at the tomb. Don't tell me women can't preach because actually a woman was the first one to carry the gospel message. You say. Jesus said to Mary, <laughs> go and tell my disciples he is risen. <laughs> Sounds like preaching to me. You know, guys, don't ever look at a woman and think, well, you can't do that. You're just a woman. Don't ever say, well, I'm just a stay-at-home mom or I'm just a janitor. Or, I just clean houses for a living. Nobody's a just to anything. We're all gifted and called in different areas, and we need to be proud of whatever God's called us to do. No matter what the world thinks about it, you need to be proud of what God has called you to do. I don't care if the world thinks it's the littlest thing out there. You be proud of what God has called you to do. And if you're assigned to clean toilets in the church, you make them the prettiest toilets that anybody's ever seen. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, you're going to like this. Let me, just, let me just tell you how women are. Mom and dad were watching TV, and mom said, I'm tired, and I'm, it's getting late. I think I'm going to go to bed. So she went to the kitchen to make sandwiches for the next day's lunches, rinsed out the dessert bowls, took meat out of the freezer for supper the following evening, checked the cereal box levels, filled the sugar container, put spoons and bowls on the table, start, got the coffee pot all set up for brewing the next morning. She then put some wet clothes in the dryer, put a load of clothes in the washer, ironed a shirt, sewed a button on, picked up the game pieces left on the table, put the telephone book back into the drawer. She watered the plants, emptied a waste basket, hung up a towel to dry, yawned, stretched, stretched and said, oh, I think I'll go to bed. She stopped by the desk, wrote a note to the teacher, counted out some cash for the school outing the next day, pulled a textbook out from under a chair and put it back where it belonged. Signed a birthday card for a friend, addressed and stamped an envelope and wrote a quick list for the supermarket. She put both of them near her purse. Mom then creamed her face, put on moisturizer, brushed and, brushed and flossed her teeth, trimmed her nails. Hubby called and said, I thought you were going to bed. I'm on my way, she said. 
She put some water into the dog's bowl, put the cat outside, then made sure the doors were locked. She looked in on each one of the children, turned on a bedside lamp, hung up a shirt, threw some dirty socks in the laundry basket, had a brief conversation with one child who was still doing homework. In her own room, she set the alarm, laid out clothes for the next day, straightened up the shoe rack. She added three things to her list of to-do things for the next day. About that time, the hubby turned off the TV and said, to no one in particular, I'm going to bed, and he did. do not tell me that women are the weaker sex. I may still need Dave to get the mayonnaise lid off the jar, but I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm equal to anything, ready for anything through him who infuses inner strength into me. And I don't care whether I feel confident or not, I will be confident. And no matter how I feel, I will never let the enemy use it to take me out. I am going to finish what God has called me to do. Can anybody say amen? Amen. You know, when we are confident in who we are in Christ, it allows us to face life with boldness, and it releases us from jealousy and envy toward other people. Thankfully, we don't have to compare ourselves with anyone. We have self-confidence only because Christ lives in us, and it is His confidence that we draw on. Today, we're offering a six-part series called Attitudes of the Heart. We need to have a confident attitude. And you know what I've discovered? I don't have to feel confident to be confident. Get this series and learn all you can about having the best attitude that you can possibly have. Need a change in your life? Maybe all you need is a change in your outlook. Attitudes of the Heart, a six-part series by Joyce Meyer, will help you discover the power of a positive attitude and help you experience a life more fulfilling than you could have ever imagined. Begin building a foundation for success today when you request Joyce's six-part audio teaching series on Attitudes of the Heart with a donation of $30 or more. Call toll-free 1-800-727-9673 or visit JoyceMeyer.org. The Joyce Meyer Ministries Conference Tour is coming to San Jose, California, October 11th, 12th, and 13th with worship by Jesus Culture. For more information, visit us online at JoyceMeyer.org or call toll-free 1-866-C-JOYCE. You mean more to us at Joyce Meyer Ministries than you may ever know. We appreciate you, and we thank our friends and partners for making this worldwide ministry possible. Together, we're feeding the hungry, clothing the poor, and presenting the gospel to the nations. Please contact us or visit JoyceMeyer.org today to share your prayer requests, find out more about our resources, see Joyce's conference schedule, and to join us in partnership as we share the love of Christ around the globe. The proceeding was paid for by the friends and partners of Joyce Meyer Ministries.